consoles out on the kitchen table, and my brother Tim born on the dining room table. I went to Relegate Collegiate, where I distinguished myself by putting a head of garlic in the ventilation system, stinking up the whole school for a week. When I was 14, I worked as a busboy at the old mill during the school year. Then in the summers, I worked in my dad's diner at the corner of Dundas and Pembroke that was frequented by Damon Runny and us characters, bookies, bootleggers, small town crooks, pimps, professional wrestlers. I helped fund my four years at the University of Toronto by working in the Shimana trade in Spadina. When I graduated in English literature, I was in debt. I worked in Swift Slaughterhouse at Kiel and St. Clair, then in Goodyear Tire at Long Branch in the Foam Rumble Department, the closest of the ever come to Dante's Inferno. <laughs> I refer to these jobs as my film school. <coughs> then in 52, the CBC started its television <coughs> service, Callow and 21. I went down to Jarvis Street to be interviewed hoping to get a job as a staff writer, but got a job as a stagehand instead. I went to work in television. You know how old I am now. I went to work in television before the CBC went on the air. But working as a stagehand and watching TV plays being done every day slowly shaped my interest in becoming a director. Many of my friends thought I was crazy to work in television. They said, hey, it's only a novelty. It'll never last. It'll be gone in a couple of years. People don't want to stay home to be entertained. They want to go out to the movies, to the theater. Boy, were they wrong. <laughs> TV expanded at a ferocious pace so that within three years, I got my first break. I was allowed to direct plays at 24. There was no high like doing a live television drama. It used to take me two days to come down from the adrenaline rush afterwards. I uh, started on the Chase and Sanborn Hour. Our lead-in theme was Charlie Chaplin's Smile. Da, 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 da. The switcher, who cut from, my one, from one camera to another, sat on my right with my finger in his face. My assistant on the left would start the countdown. Ten, nine, eight. Butterflies, the size of Pegasus, were beating their wings in my stomach. Was rolling. Six, five thoughts of my show. My show was going all across Canada. Four, three, ready camera one, ready for the music. Two, one. Hit the music, fade on camera one, super the first title on two, cue the point, cue for God's sake, take it. Super the title on three, count three, super, take it. <laughs> this frenetic conducting of the play went on for the whole length of the show. Dissolve, 20 years later. I'm having a romantic dinner with a beautiful woman. Suddenly my stomach starts churning. Oh, don't do this to me. No, no, please. But it keeps rolling. What do I hear over the restaurant speakers? Da, 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 da. To this day, I'm my pet lost dog. You're going to hear Japanese smile. Uh -uh. myself to one genre. I attribute that to those early years in live television when I did a new one-hour play every three weeks, romance, comedy, drama, satire, period pieces, thrillers. I enjoyed them all. But after two years of this madness, I decided I wanted to be a film director, to make films in Canada about the Canadian experience. And I also wanted to work in theater but, as you know, in 1957, there was precious little theater and no film industry whatsoever. What theater there was lay in the hands of British directors. As one of my TV buddies put it, oh, to be in England, now that England's here. <laughs> <laughs> directors of my generation were compelled to leave Canada if they wanted to expand into film. So I chose London to learn my craft do a film or two and then back to Canada within, within five years or so, I thought. 
1958, I came to share a flat in London with our great novelist, Henry Guy Richard. The apartment was grungy, decor, and interior design by Charles Dickens. <laughs> we were 26 <clears throat> and dreaming of glory. In 1959, Mordecai finished writing The Apprenticeship of Bitter Crowds. He gave me the manuscript, asked me to read it. I did. And I told him that not only was this the finest Canadian novel ever written, but that one day I was going back to Canada and make a film out of it. We both laughed at the absurdity of such a dream. <laughs> Several times in the 60s, though, I tried to get financing for it from Americans. I came very close with Sam Arkoff, head of American International Pictures. But he, sharing Hollywood's reluctance to depict Jewish protagonists, wanted me to make Goody a Greek. <laughs> I said, no. Another interested American financier wanted the story to be moved to Pittsburgh because Montreal was too parochial. Pittsburgh is too parochial, I said. He said, he insisted. I said, no. Then he said, no. <laughs> Then, in the late 60s, with the setting up of the Canadian Film Development Corporation, it was possible for me to adapt my best friend's novel about violating its integrity. Fourteen years, fourteen years of dreaming had finally become a reality. The man behind it, of course, was the man also being honored tonight, the first executive director of the CFDC, Michael Spencer. Thank you. 